Hi, I'm Mike Jones. I'm one of the writers of Soul, and this is the Screenplay Breakdown. How are you guys? We're good, we're Doing good. Great. And congratulations on the nomination for Soul. We absolutely love the movie. Oh, thank you. Oh, so cool. funny and so creative. It's yeah. I don't yeah. get it. I don't get how you guys come up with this stuff. <laughs> I couldn't stop thinking about it after I watched it. I was like... You know, up yeah. in bed late night, thinking yeah. about my, my life. Yeah. 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 It kept me up. It kept me up for four fucking years. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Oh, man. Yeah, so Mike, we also have a scene that you picked out that we're going to pull up in a second. So we'd love for you just to break down the scene for us a little bit. And Yeah, yeah, I can totally do that. Awesome. This is when Joe and 22 finally break out of the U seminar because uh, 22 knows a guy who can get Joe back to his body. And so that's where they meet the mystics without borders. So there were early versions of the story where Joe stayed at the U seminar the entire time. But as we kept developing it, we realized we needed to get Joe to his body and we needed to get 22 down to earth to really learn what life is all about. And so, you know, what better way than to dream up a character called Moonwind, who is this mystic. Moonwind, how are you? On the brink of madness, thanks for asking. Hey, got a request for you. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get back to my body. Can... Uh, and Pete and I and Kemp actually interviewed quite a number of mystics. You know, one guy brought in a drum and said like, if he drummed it at a certain like beat, we all would enter the spiritual realm. And I have no doubt that we would have had we, had we let him continue to drum for several hours. But, <laughs> and a lot of the mystics would talk about thin spots that um, are these places around Earth and particular places on Earth where the physical realm and the spiritual realm, the border between them is thin. One of the mystics told us that she would leave her body in a spiritual trance and go meet the rest of her friends on the spiritual plane. And I love that idea. <laughs> and they had, like, had a particular day of the week at a particular time, and they would all just meet up on the spiritual plane and hang out. So that's where these characters kind of came from. You know, They're all friends, they all hang out, they all save lost souls. You know, I think we went with this hedge fund manager who obviously looks like a guy who's been indulging, you know, himself a bit too much. What am I doing with my life? I'm alive! I'm alive! Free yourself! Okay. <laughs> that was so funny, man. That was so funny. Yeah. Uh, it's the dude uh with the <laughs> the metal detector. The metal detector. Yeah. Oh man, gotta, gotta, find find it, gotta find it, gotta find it. So like the whole concept of the movie and like, you know, the lost souls and all that, like it is, it's like very deep. Like, was it ever questioned? Was the, was the idea ever questioned that like it was too deep for children? Yeah, all the time. And yeah. we questioned it all the time ourselves, yeah. you know, but we had the same issue. We had the same issues um, with Inside Out. And there weren't issues with externally. They were just issues with us. Like we were thinking, I, I was I was on some of the brain trusts of Inside Out. I wasn't involved in the development of that. But Pete would tell me about it. He would say like, we're doing uh, this movie about emotions and like, do kids even get it? And now we're doing a movie about life and death and souls and the meaning of life. And are, are, do kids, are kids going to even get that? And so but we did the same thing as, as what they did on Inside Out is that we brought in a uh, a group of kids to watch the movie. Maybe, you know, maybe about, I guess it was about two, or, two and a half or three years in when the story is kind of getting locked, is kind of getting, you know, nailed down. These are all kids, our kids, right? My two kids, you know, we put them in the theater along with a bunch of others, all sorts of age ranges. And we watched, they watched the movie in, in its real form, right, in, the, in drawings. And um, then we asked them a bunch of questions afterwards and they got it. Like we were just uh, so uh, wow. happy that they got it. Now, the thing is like they, you know, they might get it on their level, uh, which is very different than our level. Right. But they mm -hmm. still get it. They still get something. And that's what I love about Pixar movies is that they can you can understand them on one level and then come at it a year later, two years later, three years later as you grow up and more and more opens up to you right yeah, yeah. and that's what we really wanted soul to be for kids you know wow. Wow. we kind of always understood that this was probably more a little bit of a more of adult movie than what we usually do um but we weren't scared of it you know mm. we wanted we we dove right into it what would you say like you know you talk about the uh you know you can come back and two years later and find something mm. new in it like what do you think makes like pixar movies just so great about that like that aspect you know like what I guess, what is the secret formula to making a Pixar how you, movie? How do you achieve that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you guys obviously have like a flawless track record. How do you <laughs> yeah. keep up with that? Well, it's um, we're 
we are always having to dig deep within ourselves. We are mm. always having to find like that truth within ourselves. And it's never on the surface as with any of us, right? You kind of have to really, really dig down. And I remember early conversations with Pete about what should this movie be? What is the message of this movie? The message of this movie isn't the meaning of life. We kind of knew that early on. Neither one of us are qualified, nor I don't know anybody who's qualified to really talk or say or what the meaning of life is. But we did feel that life has its own meaning, that maybe that maybe life itself is the meaning, right? All the wonderful things, all these wonderful things that, uh, of life that come that maybe you recognize in the moment or maybe you recognize a little bit later. And so once we kind of had that, we um, we both kind of held hands and Kemp and Dana and the Peru, we all kind of held hands. We said like, let's make the movie about that. But that means we're going to have to sit and we're going to have to talk about stuff that's hard, right? Mm. And um, that's what we did. We did that for years, you know. And and I think that one, you know, one, one, t one moment that really come came through is during the time of making it, my father was passing away. And he uh, he was in Texas and, you know, the Pixar is in Emeryville, so I would fly in to meet him and kind of be with him as he declined, right? And when we're sitting around the conference room, conference room about this movie, we're talking about looking back on our life and, and what does it mean to live a fulfilled life? And then I'm flying into Texas and sitting with a uh, my dear father, who I loved, who was dying, and I'm thinking those same things, and I'm going like, "Ah, oh, man, this is, this is fucking heavy." Yeah. <laughs> and wow. so I, well, you know, but I remember just holding his hand and thinking, "What is he thinking about right now? Like, is wow. he thinking wow. about the regrets of his life? Is he thinking about what he should have done differently, or is maybe he just, um, maybe he just loves being here?" and sitting next to his son who's holding his hand as he passes away. Maybe it's something as simple and beautiful as that. So once I came back from that experience and after he passed away and I was telling this to Pete and the rest of the crew, and I said like, I feel like there's something there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the uh, epiphany moment came from, where Joe lines up, you know, all of the uh, totems that 22 has collected, you know, during this adventure. and those memories of 22 then bleed into memories of Joe's own life, you know, including memories of being with his father. And um, I think once we had that, uh, I felt that we were getting there. Of course, it took a long, long time to try to, you know, to try to really nail that, even that concept down. But Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mike, did your father passing, did that also play into the role of Joe not having his father there in the film? Um, let's see. Joe's father was always, uh, had always passed away before the film began. Um, so it didn't, my father's passing didn't affect that, but certainly, um, certainly those smaller moments of being with a loved one that maybe you take for granted at that time that then come back to you, um, as you look back on your life and try to find where you felt it the most. Because I will think like Pete will, um, say the same thing. This is not, this is, He's won awards. He's won several Oscars. He's maybe one of um, the most gifted American directors working today. But you ask him, like, what's important in his life? And he's not going to say that. He's not going to say Oscars. He's not going to say awards. He's going to say these moments. Actually, making the movie is one of those moments, too. Like, being with all these people and collaborating, like, that's a moment that he's going to remember. You know, it's a moment I'm going to remember. Maybe sky watching can be my spark. Or walking. I'm really good at walking. Those really aren't purposes, 22. That's just regular old living. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, I, yeah I'm <laughs> getting chills right now. <laughs> so something I always wondered, like, you guys, you create these insane universes, right? Like, in these incredible stories. But every universe needs a set of rules, right? That they can follow. Like, how do you guys come up with the rules like Joe can't just take 22's badge and jump down the hole right back to yeah. back to his body how do you guys do that rules they haunt us yeah. they haunt us because once you create a world of rules then um you have to communicate those rules to the audience that's the hardest part too yeah. one of the hardest parts is communicating the rules and so that the audience can go like wait all right it, it, once the audience starts trying to over logic your movie, you've lost them, right? Mm -hmm. So we always try to make rules based on uh, usually an obstacle that the character has to overcome, right? Yeah. 
So if it's um, Joe can't just grab a pass and go down and be back in his body, he actually needs to be kind of handcuffed to 22. And that would because 22, we need we need 22 um, to discover what it means to live a fulfilled life at this in the same way that Joe discovers it. And the way to do that is to handcuff them. And so, um, you know, that's probably where that rule came from. I'm trying to remember where that rule came from. But uh, so but every time, you know, we're always about putting obstacles in front of our characters that our characters either fail at or overcome to meet like an even bigger obstacle, you know. Mm. Uh, so that's where I would say like our rules are mostly based. But then we just sometimes we get way too rule ruley and somebody <laughs> yeah. will ring a bell and one of the brain trusts and goes like, I lost you at rule 51. Like <laughs> you guys have to simplify this shit down. And so we would go, okay, yeah, you know, all right, we got to do that. And um, we always find, I always find that in the development of these that I can write and try to logic or feather in rules to make them feel like they belong p- part of the story but it's really in edit that um you can really see whether that's working or not and we found sometimes that um for instance the rule this is i'm gonna spoil the movie but um (laughs) when joe plays his life right he wakes up out of that epiphany moment and he realizes i gotta go get 22 i i gotta i gotta go help that soul and so from there he has to go back into he has to play again and go back into the astral plane. And we're thinking, well, God, we thought forever. Well, how do, how do we get him back? Like, do we need to create like a portal? Does he go find Moonwind again and Moonwind like draw another? We literally had uh, a rewrote scenes where he goes and finds Moonwind in Times Square because Times Square was a thin spot and, and Moonwind like tra- teleported him back. It, but it just took way too long. Mm. And then like, but an edit... Uh, Kevin Nolting just kind of quickly cut together and goes, what if this happens? And he just plays and he's there. Wow. And we looked at it and we go like, oh, well, shit. Yeah, that worked. <laughs> you know? so Why didn't we think of like, that? Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind yeah, speaking a little about, you know, you just talk about the brain trust yeah. bouncing off ideas and like, um, yeah. Do you mind just talking about, you know, that process and how you guys take notes and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't mind. It's the brain trust is, um, you know, it's, it, it's such a part of, Pixar lore and Pixar history, we have maybe about six to eight screenings of our movies, right? And so that means we have six to eight brain trusts. I think Soul had, trying to remember how many brain trusts it had. I can't remember, maybe six. And so we are making, what that means is that we are making the movie six six times completely. Wow. So we are drawing it, we are recording it, we are... Uh, temping it with a score and, you know, putting scratch actors in there and, and special effects and stuff or uh, uh, audio effects and stuff like that. So, so that what you are seeing is a, is a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. So we are essentially shooting the movie over and over and over again for four to five to six years. Wow. And uh, I feel like, you know, that's really one of Pixar's great secrets. I mean, if you had, four years plus to shoot a live action movie, you probably would find a pretty good movie there eventually. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. I mean, wow. uh, uh, boyhood is one, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we make the movie, then we screen it for the company and then a select number of those, uh, those people go up to, uh, West side one are where we do our brain trusts and, you know, they, they just start in, they start in wow. on you. And it's hard. It's yeah, really I was gonna, really hard. I was gonna ask, like, oh, how do man. you? I mean, no one likes taking criticism, right? Like, it's just it's hard yeah. for anybody. It's hard for me. Like, yeah. how do you how do you put the ego and the pride aside and and just take get the it? job done? You, yeah. Can't. Yeah. you can't. You can't. You can't. I mean, not not with something like this. Not with something where we have in every one, particularly with Soul, in a movie that we are really reaching deep to try to convey these really heavy emotional concepts, your ego goes right in there. And so um, that's, we, you know, we got, I remember in the first three or four of them were hard. The first ones are, the the first one's usually great. Cause it's like, oh wait, this, they say, this is gonna be great. And that's, those are just (laughs) deathly words, right? Because then (laughs) screening two, three, four, five, Like, it's just, oh, man, you're just not there. You're just not there. You're just not there. And sometimes you have just a screening that just hits rock bottom, right? 
And what we've tried, I remember early on, we tried to meet right after the brain trust and try to talk through all of the notes that we got to, to think about what's the way forward for the next screening. And we couldn't ever do it. Instead, we would like sit and usually open up a bottle of alcohol and just go, man, that was rough. <laughs> and um, was rough. we try not to. So, so we became, we kind of instilled this rule, like we're not going to talk about the brain trust after the brain trust. We're going to kind of decompress. We need to, we need to sleep. We need to process all of this. And then in the next couple of days, let's get together on a cork board and replot out um, what we're going to do considering these notes. Wow. And, um, it's, uh, it's not, I don't, I don't want to say I hate it. I don't hate it, but it is a, it is a gauntlet that you go through at Pixar. Mm -hmm. Um, you're also, you know, you're looking for the stuff that works too, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to know what works in order to, you know, in order to emphasize that or to know, um, where the audience is hooking in. So we're also looking for that in the brain trust too. And the brain trusts are usually really good about that. They go, we really love this. We really think this is funny. This arc is really coming coming across. This character is a little thin. Some of the notes we got in early on were about Joe. We hadn't really found Joe yet. Wow. And we were always getting notes like, who's Joe? Who is Joe? Who is Joe? Wow. Uh, wow that's and that's when, um, you know, Kemp came on after screening two or three, and that's when that started to really get uh, screwed down. Mike, was there ever... A moment during you know the process of of creating this film was there ever a moment where you're like I can't do this shit anymore like I I I want to quit basically was there ever a moment you wanted to just like walk away from it because it was just too much? No, there was never one of those. I mean, there were hard days, um, mm -hmm. but you're not in it alone, yeah. and um, there is something about not being in it alone that helps. It's uh, you know. Pete and Kemp and I, I mean, I became really close with Kemp. Mm. And so uh, to know that we were both going through the same thing and we would go into my office and shut the door and um, just kind of vent about whatever particular hard spot we were in helped a great deal, you know. And then Pete would join sometimes and Kristen and Trevor, the heads of story and Dana. Like, so we, you're never alone in it. Mm -hmm. Um like when, when, when bad news comes, it seems to come to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and so you all kind of huddle up and you like, how are we going to get through this? Well, we'll deal with it. We'll get through it. How so, do you, how do you deal with those, those moments where you're like, you feel stuck in the story and you're. I whiteboard. I it literally, I, there is, I have in my office, it's like I have three or four whiteboards. And so what I do when I'm stuck is I'll just start drawing plot arcs and character arcs and, um, you know, you just draw, uh, what I typically do is I just draw one long upside down U. I say the character is starting here. I want the character to end up here. And then what's happening in between? And I just start plotting it out. I just start writing, 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 writing. And it's something about that writing that will free up something. And then if I find I'm on to something, I will typically bring Pete in the room uh, and Kemp and I will pitch it to them. And they will go, oh, yeah, and then what about this? And then what about this? So it's really like to bring people in and then pitch them through always works to a certain regard, mm -hmm. uh, for me at least. But um, it's not easy, you know. Mm -hmm. So what's that, mo what's that moment like when you, like the light bulb goes off and you figured out like where you're going to go next and then you bring everyone in and they're like, yes, that's it. Like what is, what is that like? It's like it's the moments that make it all worth it. Yeah. It's the moments that wow. that make it that make <clears throat> you appreciate. Um, it's the moments you're right for, right? Right. I mean, it's it's the moments where something clears up and the clouds part, and you can see your story and you can see the potential of that story. I mean, it is the moment that, like, I I love I, I will watch the movie right now, and instead of watching it, I will just pick it apart. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, yeah, I'm yeah. too close to it. Right. But it's really those moments of making it that um, that I love so much. Where did uh, so you said you've been working on it for four years? Where what was the original pitch for the movie? Where did that come from? Well, it was um, Pete uh, had just come off Inside Out, and uh, he was trying to think up a new idea. And the only thing he had was he wanted a film set beyond space and time where souls are given their personality, because. His son uh, seemed to be born with this personality that was really distinct from he and his wife. And, and it didn't come from either he and his wife. He felt it came from someplace else. And he so he imagined this place wow. that we would later call the U Seminar. Here at the U Seminar, all new souls are given unique and 
individual personalities. I'm an agreeable skeptic who's cautious yet flamboyant. But he didn't have anything beyond that. And he said, like, I, maybe, the, maybe the story is about, like, a John Belushi character who never wants to leave, you know? <laughs> or maybe the story is about um, a person who ends up there who's desperately trying to get back to their life because they feel it was uh, unfulfilled. My life was meaningless. And I said, like, let's put them both in because both of those characters can, can, uh, can push on the other, Yeah, can work right? against each other. Those, both of those uh, opposing views are perfect together. Mm-hmm. And so once we had that, we found that probably within the first couple of weeks of just meeting, wow. I was only there to just to just to sit with Pete and kind of help free stuff. Right. And just talk it through and card out and see where it goes. But I thought that after that week, I would be let go because um, and I was <laughs> like they said, I had been working at Pixar as a as a writer in similar fashions to a bunch of different directors there for a number of years, ever since uh, good dinosaur, I've been doing that. Wow. Um, and then, but, uh, if this was my last week and in my last week, they go, well, in your last week, we want you to meet with Pete. And I go, ah, I never met with Pete. I saw him in some brain trust and stuff like that. So I go like, okay, well I'll do one last week with Pete. And then like, I got to go find some work. And, uh, I had already moved my family up here. And so I was like, I got in my car and I drove down to L.A. after that week was done. This is, I gave up my gave up my key card and my computer, like the gates closed behind me. And I go like, oh, that's it. Pixar's done. Well, it was yeah. a good run. And I was oh, really man. sad about it. Oh, man. <laughs> and so like I was on the way to L.A. to um, my agent had set up a bunch more meetings because I needed to get some work. Right. And I was in Bakersfield. Pixar called and said, like, Pete loved working with you. Come back up and work. Come back up and we'll give your wow. job back. Wow. And I literally went back and I picked up my computer and my key card and I was like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Do you do you mind speaking a little bit like how you got involved in Pixar? And I guess for anyone who's listening, like, how yeah. do they get, you know, how, how do, do they, they how do they make a yeah. Pixar movie? Yeah. Well, let's see. The I got noticed by Pixar from a script that I wrote. Um, a spec script, spec adaptation of a book called uh, "The Minotaur Takes a Cigarette Break." I don't know if you've heard of this book before, but it's a it's about the Minotaur working as a short order grill cook in a steakhouse in Wichita, Kansas, and he's kind of a shell of the monster he used to be, and everybody picks on him, and um, he kind of finds his kind of monsterness again, for, for lack of a better word. And um, the book was loosely disguised comment on class and income inequality, right? And I love that because I used to work those kind of shitty jobs um, when I was growing up in Texas. I used to work at the pizzeria and at the bar. You know, I used to be the busboy and stuff like that. So I understood it to a certain level and I loved it. And there's also all these other mythological creatures that work all these other shitty jobs all in this, <laughs> uh, in this awesome. town. And so uh, I wrote that spec and it got around town a lot because it was unusual and um, people really liked it. Uh, it'll never get made. It's just one of those... One of those mini scripts I feel like I have that people like, and then that's it, and we'll never get it. But it got it, it got it, found its way to Pixar. Wow. Shows your potential. For, <laughs> wow. well, yeah, and for Pixar, awesome. like they thought that was, um, they loved it. They called me and they said, like, if ever you're in the Bay Area, um, you know, come on by, we'd love to have you for lunch. And I said, well, I'm funny enough, I'm going to be in the Bay Area. I was living in LA at the time. I said, if, I'm going to be in the Bay Area tomorrow weird <laughs> and i just got in my car <laughs> and i drove straight up That's and i met joke. with them wow. Wow. and i had this great lunch with them where i talked and talked and talked and then that was my entryway into pixar after that i went and i worked with um bob peterson on the first version of good dinosaur for uh for a while and then jumped kind of from director to director before i finally ended up with pete wow wow mike did you go to school for screenwriting or was this something you just like picked up one day you're like this is kind of fun i'm good at this well, well no i went to uh i was going to be an english teacher uh i was i went to the university of north texas i grew up in texas and so i went to unt for two years just to be an english teacher but i fell in with this group of group of people who loved film and they would talk about film all the time and i watched a lot of movies with my dad my dad loved movies but they were talking about like fellini movies and stuff like that films i had never seen before so i started to watch all of these fantastic like foreign and um early like american independent art art movies uh and i loved them they all said we want all go to film school because film school was kind of becoming a thing so i wrote like a 
some weird script. I have no idea what it's about, but it's probably <laughs> terrible. And I sent it to NYU and I got in. Wow. wow. And for some reason, just the idea of going to New York City out of Texas, which I had really never left, was I couldn't get it out of my head. I had to go. And NYU is incredibly expensive. And I begged, borrowed, and stole everything I could to get there. But I went there as a cinema to study cinematography. I wanted to be a cinematographer. Wow. I wanted to shoot movies. Hmm. Wow. But then a writing teacher took me aside and took me out to lunch and said, like, you know, because you 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 have to do a writing course as part of your undergraduate work there. And and he said, you know, you ought to you're a good writer, you ought to think about it. And so that's kind of how I got my foot in the door. That's wow. awesome. You wow. thought about so, it and now you're at Pixar. And now you're at Pixar, yeah. <laughs> yeah now awesome. I'm at Pixar. Right. <laughs> uh I kinda wanna if you don't mind, I kinda wanna go back to the the brain trust. Um mm-hmm. have you guys ever had a like has there ever been a, a time where maybe the story is just like just not working for whatever reason and you've you've gone through it six different times right have you ever had to just like scrap a, an idea because it just yeah 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 a few times uh-huh. yeah and it's always hard yeah i mean are you talking scrapping whole movies yeah let's say you said you do like six brain trusts right is that you you get together yeah. six different times so yeah say that you're like six or seven brain trusts deep and the idea just still is not working yeah i mean pixar pixar will make that hard call if it's not coming together it, it's really hard and it's not a call that they make lightly. And, wow. um, you know, it happened on, you know, Newt, uh, there's some, everybody knows a little bit about Newt. It happened on the um, first version of Good Dinosaur, you know, and then what happens is they will either, you know, kind of change. Usually it's the writer that gets um, changed out first. Mm. Um, so being a writer at Pixar, uh, I'm a, um, I'm an employee now, so I'm kind of Pixar's, um, you know, lone writer there. But they hire into hire uh, writers um, out of Hollywood, or you know, even some writers that live here actually as independent contractors. And so, um, it's pretty it's it's a hard job, you know, and it's mm-hmm. a hard it's it's a hard thing to do to switch out the yeah. creative, you know, like that. Wow. Um, and sometimes they switch out the director, you know. Um, that's not unique to Pixar. It happens on a number of different animated movies. Mike, when when writing Soul, like, are there? Um, do you guys ever go back to previous Pixar films just for reference, or like, if you feel stuck mm. for anything, like, for any kind of inspiration? Yeah, yeah, we 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 reference our films a lot when we're trying to build that story. Probably a little too much. Yeah, uh, I, like we'll always talk about. Well, in Toy Story, we did this, and in um, Nemo, we did this, and in Up, we did this, and. Uh, and that's helpful. It's helpful, particularly when you hit like a roadblock. But, you know, I um, I think that you can get stuck telling the same story over mm-hmm. and over again. I think you can get stuck in formula. Yeah. And um, as uh, what I love about Soul is that Soul at the end of this movie has, it gives the main character exactly he wants. Get ready, Joe Gardner. Your life is about to start. I loved that, like, and really early on, we said, like, we really want Joe to play that gig. Mm-hmm. And that's that breaks a little bit of the formula for us. And right. I loved that. You know, I want to do that more. I think the audience is, is smart. I think mm-hmm. it, they're, they're, they're a lot smarter than we give them credit, maybe give them credit for. Or, uh, because I think that sometimes they know structure like in their bones, like they watch so many movies yeah. with the three act structure or the four act structure. And they know like what the midpoint is. They know what to feel during the midpoint. Even maybe they not might not be able to voice it. They, they, they can't anticipate it. Mm-hmm. And when the audience can anticipate the movie, I feel like you're, it's not working. Yeah. You know, I, I really want to surprise the audience. I really want to take them down someplace they haven't been before and while we can do that visually at Pixar, we can do anything mm-hmm. at, we, visually at Pixar, um, I kind of next really want to explore how can we do it just in the very bones of the story. Wow. Awesome. And you, yeah, you mentioned, like, you know, like about you wanted Joe to, you know, really get that gig. And for me, I wasn't expecting that to happen. And, you know, when it did happen, you you really weren't expecting him to not be satisfied. With yeah. It. yeah. And I really love that moment where Dorothea tells Joe about the story of the fish. Do you mind speaking into what inspired that scene? Yeah. Yeah, we always thought Dorothea would give Joe a clue of um, how to get out of this um, rut he's kind of got himself in. He's finally played the gig. 
He thinks he's finally done it, yet he feels this emptiness inside. And I remember Pete and I talked to Trent Reznor, but Trent told us, he said, I thought that if I played like those big stadium gigs as Nine Inch Nails and after I got that and I did it like that would be it and I would feel this completeness. I'd feel fulfilled. I'd feel like, yes, I've arrived. But then he found when he did it, afterwards he didn't feel that. There's something missing. There was this emptiness inside still there. And it didn't fix anything for him. And we wanted that same feeling for Joe. And so we had Dorothea say a number of different things. We tried a number of different things. For a while she said, like, you know what? I had a great cup of coffee today. Like something like that. Just something really simple. Mm. We found that wasn't really maybe a little too vague. And Pete actually came up with that line about uh, the fish. And uh, I just thought it worked so well. I thought I'd feel different. I heard this story about a fish. He swims up to this older fish and says, I'm trying to find this thing they call the ocean. The ocean, says the older fish. That's what you're in right now. This, says the young fish, this is water. What I want is the ocean. So, how did you guys land on Joe, like, being a jazz musician? Like, as, you know, the main character's occupation. Is it just, like, music being, like, a totally spiritual thing? Well, first, we wanted... We we first were developing a story about an actor who gets his big break on Broadway in a revival of Death of a Salesman. And we thought, like, that was really clever. (laughs) But, uh... It's like, I don't know, we, we, the more we thought about it, the more we wanted, there's just a little bit more uh, depth to it, um, just a, a, another level to it. And we really were, Pete and I were, uh, both love jazz. And so when that kind of hit us, we said like, oh my gosh, yeah, I mean, it's improv. It's, um, we can really thread the movie with um, some fantastic jazz. Um, and uh, also it's kind of a one of maybe the greatest American um, art forms, mm. you know, truly American art forms is jazz. Mm. Uh, and it just, once we said it, it just felt so right. Mm. You know, it's awesome. I love it. What what would you say is like your favorite scene from the movie? If you had to pick any of them, I know you're, you know, it's probably d- difficult, but what would you say is like one of the ones that stick out the most to you? Well, I think, uh, you know, certainly the epiphany moment when he's playing his life. I, I love mm. that moment. But mm. the moment that I I particularly love is when he takes 22's hand and he jumps down with her. Mm. Um, and they just have a silent moment between them. And they kind of are on this ride together. And then at some point during that fall, the, the pull starts to happen. And she realizes that she has to let go and that and he realizes he has to let go. And it's wordless, right? She she looks a little worried. And he kind of looks at her and just kind of gives her a, little, a measure of reassurance that mm-hmm. it's going to be okay. And then they split and she goes to live her life and he goes back up to the slide walk toward the great beyond. I love that moment. And that that is a moment that um, I, we wrote early on and it was Kevin Nolting, the editor, and then we had the story artist board it. And then the editor called me, says, come into the editing room. I just want to show you something. And he just showed me that one moment. We didn't really have much of the movie before that. We just had that one. We had bits and pieces. and then, But we did have that whole sequence. Uh, and as we looked at it, we said, like, that's our North Star. Like, uh-huh. that's, our, that's our moment that we should be, that we should be shooting for. Uh-huh. Um, and that moment never changed. It was written really early on, and it never, never wow. changed. And it's kind of great because one of the one of the things we try to do at Pixar is we try to look for those North Stars. Like um, in Coco, when he sings um, Remember Me to the grandmother at the end. Remember me. Cried at that moment. <laughs> broke down. I break, broke down in tears ever since the script reading of that, right? Wow. I didn't even need to see it to break down in tears. And yeah, like, yeah. suddenly they knew, yes, North Star. Like, that's where that's, let's, let's wow. drive toward that. So to have that, you know, um, sometimes the North Star is, you know, kind of in the very beginning of the movie, like in, uh, like in Up, right? You know, uh, Ronnie Del Carmen's fantastic uh it's called Mar- the married life sequence, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of became the North Star for that movie and the thing they always always looked back for. Like in every sequence you write and everything that you do, you're looking back, how does that relate to that to that moment, right? 
Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. Mike, wow. I got uh, one last question. We'll let you go. Yeah. You've given us so much of your time already, and we appreciate it so yeah. much. But uh, one last question. Yeah. It, will there be a soul two? And do we get to see who 22 ends up growing up to be? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't thought about it. I mean, I don't know. Like, soul is a hard one. If you, it, like, I don't know that there's a there's a second movie in there. Maybe. <laughs> I have no idea. It might, it I mean, be perfect the way it is. It's <laughs> yeah. totally perfect the way it is. And maybe you don't touch it, but I just like watching. Uh, yeah, that moment that you love when they're separating yeah. and 22 is going to live her life. Like, part of me, like, you know, wants to see what that looks like. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I figured, I figured we I'd thought ask. We thought about moments like, is is there a moment where where we see briefly what happened to that soul, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we just thought, I don't know, we be better to leave the mystery. You know, don't yeah, need it. Yeah, leave it up to your the no, it's audience's those, imagination. It's kind right? of the yeah, it's kind of the same thing like you were saying with Joe. Like you, you want to see him get, you know, you want to see him make that gig, mm. and then he does, and you're kind of surprised when he does. Mm -hmm. And it the same thing. I watching it, I was like, oh wow, we're gonna get to see where 22 goes, and then you don't, and you're yeah. like. And it's it's, it's a better, like, it's a better ending. For it's a better too. ending. Mm -hmm. It's it just works better. I kind of love that. I kind of love that people want to know. You know, people yeah. also mm -hmm. really want to really want to know why we didn't include Lisa in there. You know, Lisa's like the the memory that twenty two retrieves from Joe's mind oh, right, about right. the oh who's she goes who's Lisa. Hey, hey, stay out of there. Oh, relax. There's not much here. Jazz, jazz, more jazz. Oh, and someone named Lisa. Who's that? Uh, never mind. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. right. And we've gotten like yeah, so yeah, yeah. many emails and so many like texts from people going like, why didn't you, we want to know who Lisa is. Like, is there going to be a Lisa movie? And then, no, there's not going to be a Lisa movie. Oh, but so people, th that's great because I feel like people really care, you know, they care about yeah, those yeah. characters and they want to see that, you know, I totally, feel like that's just totally. a win. It's kind of like the great beyond. I feel like all of us really want yeah. to see what you guys are going to do with the great beyond, but then you never see it and you're yeah. like, it's better. It's better that yeah. way. Yeah. We even oh. like, there was, ver I mean, this shows you just how, how deep we go into these. There were versions where he does go into the great beyond <laughs> and wow. we just, yeah. we looked wow. at him and go like, it's just not, not working. We actually had versions where he goes into the great beyond and he meets his dad. And uh, I thought like, and, and, and we pulled back on it because um, I don't remember just over the course of the many years of making that movie that it just didn't quite fit. Mm. But uh, at the end of the day, we just looked at it and you go, well, I don't know. We don't want to go in there, you know, yeah. mm. like leave mm, it, nah. leave it mysterious. Yeah, no, it works better that way. I think something I wanted to say as well. Uh, I love the line where 22 goes like, I've been messing with this team for years. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and the Knicks lose. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's a uh, Kemp Power. I think that the Kemp Powers line, he was, he was born, <laughs> born to write that. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike, for your time. Yeah, Mike, yeah. thank you. We, we grew up watching Pixar and we will never stop are. watching still Pixar. Are. Oh, great. It was such a joy and a pleasure talking with you. Oh, and, thank yeah. you so much. It's a really pleasure to talk to you. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Mike. Have, Have a good, good rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.